My dear brothers and sisters, we have all made vows to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-A'raf verse 172, and remember when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala extracted from the children of Adam their loins from their backs and made them testify, Alastu bi rabbikum, am I not your Lord? And they said, Qalu bala shahidna. Indeed, we have testified so that on the day of judgment, we will not be able to say that we were heedless of this affair, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our creator and sustainer. And that was one of the first things that came to my mind, the vow, the, vow, the covenant that we made with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Greater than any vow that a husband makes to a wife or a wife to a husband or a mother to a child or any other relationship. Yet you see, when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, shaitan has won this battle in distancing us from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I want to dedicate this talk to loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again. I want to dedicate this talk to getting to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again in hopes that we can fulfill our vow to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala no matter what happens in our lives, no matter how bad that amnesia gets, no matter how bad the accident, we will always know who Allah is and why we love Him. Let's start off by how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us of this in the Quran. The famous verse that all of us know here, we've heard it many, many times, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ That I did not create the mankind in jinn except for my worship. The greatest mufassir of the Quran, Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, he said about this verse, that to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning that the greatest form of worship that we can do is to get to know who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. Because once you truly know who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, you cannot help but to worship Allah and to love Allah and to venerate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Hashr, وَلَا تَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ نَسُوا اللَّهَ فَأَنْسَاهُمْ أَنفُسَهُمْ أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْفَاسِقُونَ that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us and do not become of those people who forgot Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made them forget themselves. Indeed, these people are the transgressors. Now there's two points in this verse over here. The first point is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, do not be of those people who forgot Allah. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just doesn't give you a problem. He gives you a solution as well. So the solution to having forgotten Allah is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to tell you who he is two verses later. When he goes on to tell us in these three beautiful verses who Allah is. Which starts off with, هو الله الذي لا إله إلا هو عالم الغيب والشهادة هو الرحمن الرحيم. هو الله الذي لا إله إلا هو الملك القدوس السلام المؤمن المحيمن العزيز الجبار العزيز الجبار المتكبر سبحان الله عما يشركون. هو الله الخالق البارئ المصور له الأسماء الحسنى يسبح له ما في السماوات والأرض وهو العزيز الحكيم. In these three verses, Allah subhanahu wa taala reminds us of who He is. So the people who forget Allah get to know Allah subhanahu wa taala again through His names and attributes. But Allah subhanahu wa taala teaches us a second lesson, and this is the logical proof in terms of why we need to know Allah subhanahu wa taala. We're constantly told that this journey of life is about self-discovery, discovering who we are, discovering ourselves. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in this verse that in order to truly discover who you are, in order to truly discover your potential, you need to discover who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is first. Because you will become a manifestation of the things that you ask Allah for, a manifestation of the things that you obey Allah with, a manifestation of those things that you plea Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. So in order to truly discover who you are, you need to discover who your creator is. Because if your creator is filled with generosity, he will create generosity in you. If your creator is loving, he will create love in you. If your creator is pardoning, then he will instill pardoning inside of you as well. So to discover who you are and who you should be, you need to realize and learn who your creator is. So this in summary is why we need to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Firstly, the commandment of Allah. Secondly, it's about discovering who we are. It's about discovering where we stand in the world. It's about discovering, are we really the moral and ethical people that we claim to be? Because all good comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So now let us take a look at who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually is. The most glorious name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Allah. And this is the primary name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the name Allah comes from Al-Ilah, the worshipped, Al-Ma'bud. So Allah is a signification of our worshipping of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you will see that the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose this beautiful name to constantly be used in the Quran, to constantly be used to call upon Him, is to remind us of our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To remind us of our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one of worship, one of servitude. We were created to remember Allah, to venerate Allah, to love Allah, to make sajda to Allah, to make ruku'a to Allah. This is our relationship with Him. And this is why throughout the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the term Allah to remind you that the one that created you, the one that sustains you, the one that you call upon is the only one that is worthy of your worship. Now one of the unique things about the name of Allah, Jalla fi ula, that a lot of us do not know about, is that the name Allah is one of the greatest names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us that indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a name that if he was to be called by it, he responds. If he's to be asked by it, he gives. And over the 40 opinions that exist, two of them are the strongest. They are Al-Hay and Al-Qayyum being the first opinion and Allah being the second opinion. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, but it seems that Allah is the stronger opinion. Because if you look at the du'as that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned, that mentioned the greatest names of Allah, all three of them mention Allah, but not all three of them mention Al-Hayy and Al-Qayyum. So when you call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, call Him by this name, and you'll see the miracles that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala performs. This Lord that we talk about Allah, He is Allah because He possesses every beautiful name and every beautiful attribute. And he is worthy of our worship because he possesses these names. So you see that it becomes circular in nature. That we can not only worship he who possesses all the beautiful names and attributes. And since we worship him, then by necessity, every beautiful name and attribute must belong to him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let's look at another name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Wudud. The loving and the beloved. Bring it back to the movie, when I asked the man, you know, why was he crying? One of the things he mentioned was that I wish I had a love like this in my life. And I thought to myself, subhanAllah, at that time, that no matter how much love you have in this life from your friends, from your spouses, from your parents, from everyone else in this world, you will always have a void in your heart that can only be fulfilled by the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he goes on to mention that indeed in the heart is a void that can only be fulfilled with the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And a lot of us don't realize this. A lot of mankind does not realize it. So that void that they find in their heart, they try to fulfill it with the desires of this world. Whether it be through wealth, whether it be through you know, women, whether it be through everything else, they try to fulfill it through desires. But they notice that they become more empty and more empty as these desires are fulfilled. They'll see that they'll try to fulfill it maybe with alcohol, with drugs. But where does that lead them? It leads them along the same path. They'll try to fulfill it with every each and every single thing, but it won't be fulfilled. Because that portion of your heart was created to be loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he gives a beautiful example. He says the love of Allah in the heart of the believer is like a tree. The love of the believer for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like a tree. Its roots are the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Its trunk is humility for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Its leaves is modesty from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the fruit that, it's bear, that it bears is obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you'll see that our whole relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it revolves around love. And this is why Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he gives his other famous example and parable. 
that our journey of worship towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like that of a bird whose head is love and its two wings are fear and hope. Now what is a bird without a head? It is not going to survive, it's not going to be able to fly. Similarly, our journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if it does not begin with love, then our journey will not progress. And that is why I began with Al-Wudud to remind us of this, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves us and He wants us to love Him as well. And this is one of the unique names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where not only is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the subject, but He is the object as well. So when we talk about Ar-Rahman, He is the one who shows mercy. He's not the one who has mercy shown to Him. When we talk about that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Ghaffar and Al-Ghafur, He is the forgiver, but He is not the one who is forgiven. But when it comes to Al-Wudud, not only subhanahu wa ta'ala is He the loving, but He is the beloved as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that there's not a tree except that it glorifies Allah, not a bird except that it glorifies Allah, not any one of Allah's creations except that it is glorifying the Him, except that we do not understand their glorification. Listen to the hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa where he says, the skies shake, the skies shake and creak and they have the right to shake and creak because there's not a distance of four fingers except that an angel is making ruku'ah, an angel is making sajda, an angel is making king qiyam to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this will continue till the day of judgment. This is the love that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created for him. Now our question arises, where is our love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Bidhanillahi ta'ala, we'll learn that by the end of the discussion. We move on to a sitir that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who covers up. And this is a beautiful example for all of us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us with our deficiencies, created us with our mistakes. But with these deficiencies, with these mistakes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala covers us up just like we use clothes to cover up our bodies. During the time of Musa alayhi salam, rain stopped to come down. It ceased to descend and a drought came about. So people came to Musa and they said, Ya Musa, you speak directly to your Lord. Will you not go to him and speak to him and ask him for rain to come down? So Musa, he goes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he asks him, Oh Allah, time has gone by and rain has not come down. What is the reasoning behind this? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him that there is an individual in the community who has not sought forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for 40 years. And up and until this person leaves, rain will not come down. So tell this person to leave and then rain will come down. So Musa alayhi salam goes back to his people and he tells his people, Oh people, there is an individual from amongst all of you that has been committing sins for the last 40 years and not once has he repented. Whoever he is, let him leave our community so that the rain can come down, so that we can be nursed once again. And then you can imagine in a gathering like this, no one moves, no one gets up. But then miraculously, the rain of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts to descend. And people start to wonder, what happened? Musa just said that until someone leaves, the rain is not going to come down. But no one came down. But no one left. So Musa alayhi salam, he goes back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he asks him, Oh Allah, you said that the rain will not come down up and until someone leaves. But no one left and the rain started to come down. At that time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him something so profound. He said, my slave, made such a sincere repentance, I couldn't help but forgive him. I couldn't help but forgive him. So Musa alayhi salam, being the slave of Allah, he's curious, who is the slave of Allah that got forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Perhaps I can benefit from him as well. So he asked him, Oh Allah, who is this individual that you have just forgiven and pardoned? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to tell him, Oh Musa, I concealed his sin while he was a sinner and did not expose him. Do you think that I shall expose him now that he has repented? Allahu Akbar. Allah is a satir, the one that covers up. My dear brothers and sisters, no matter what sin that you may have, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala covers that sin. It is between you and Allah. And that is why the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa has told us that all of his ummah will be forgiven. 
except for those who expose their own sins. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, while knowing that sin that you committed, He covered it up for you. So who are you to go and expose that sin? So take advantage of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being a sitir, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not expose you and turn back to Allah and repent to Him. Sufyan ibn Ayyayna, one of the great Imams of the Salaf, he said, be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not create an odor for our sins. For if indeed there was an odor for our sins, none of us would be able to sit next to another. You know, that's a big blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let us talk about Al-Mujib, the one who answers all supplications. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٍ أُجِيبُ الدَّعْوَةَ الدَّعِي إِذَا دَعَانِ That if my slave asks about me, tell them that I am near. I answer the supplication of every supplicator. Let me share the story of a, a sister with you. She says, it was the first day of Ramadan and my father had a heart attack while he was in the masjid. So they take him to the hospital. I hurry to the hospital and I'm looking at my father. And I see this beautiful old man, the man that took care of me when I was young, the man that changed my diapers, the man that took me to school, the man that tried his best to grant me every single thing that I desire. And I realized what a terrible daughter I was to him at that day. So I made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I said, Oh Allah, please grant him life so that I can show him the same righteousness that he showed me. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought him out of the heart attack and gave him life for four, for, for four more months. In these four months, she did everything she possibly could from cooking for him, cleaning for him, driving him to his appointments, any wish or desire that he had, she would be the one fulfilling it. But at the end of the four months, she starts to realize that subhanAllah, life is really getting difficult for my father. He can't go to the bathroom on his own. He can't breathe on his own. And while it's great to have him around the house, it's unjust of me to want him to keep being alive, but be suffering at the same time. So she makes dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, Oh Allah, please do not let him leave this world except in a state of obedience to you. So the day of Jummah comes four months later. He goes out for Salatul Jummah. He comes home with his friends and his family. And it's as if he's perfectly fine, perfectly healthy. Nothing is wrong at all. He spends the whole day together with his family and friends. They pray Salatul Isha and the father excuses himself. He says, I'm feeling tired. So the youngest daughter, she takes him upstairs. And not even five minutes go by, but she starts shouting, everyone come upstairs, everyone come upstairs. So everyone goes upstairs and you can imagine as if you're walking into that room and it is your own father that his spirit is leaving his body. His eyes are gazing up towards the skies and his spirit is leaving. And as that is happening, he's saying, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raja. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raja. Inna lillahi وأكون للخير العميم مثالا